On March 1st, 2010, at 2.33 Pacific Standard Time, Valve Corporation patched the video game Portal on the Steam storefront. Such updates are not particularly notable, usually some quality of life improvements. But strangely, in Valve's liner notes, they didn't include any gameplay adjustments. Only the bulletin changed radio transmission frequency to comply with federal and state spectrum management regulations. Ugh. Sounds boring. Essentially, some new radios were added to the game, up to a 26 total. Each played a unique sound, and from those sounds, mostly translating the audio to images, players were able to start an entire ARG, or alternative reality game, which led to the reveal of a second Portal game on the horizon. This ARG, in terms of a marketing stunt, was quite successful and attention-grabbing, Though, considering the popularity of the Portal franchise and the fact that the sequel was over a year away, probably didn't move the needle much on people's anticipation for Portal 2. In hindsight, the Portal ARG feels overwrought. Portal and Portal 2 aren't exapunks or dwarf fortress. They're simple, accessible, well put together puzzle games with a flair for the theatrical. Such deliberately obfuscated puzzle hunting likely went right over the audience's head. That's not to say the ARG wasn't enjoyable, but what it tells us about the Portal franchise is fraught. The ARG is not representative of the games it promotes. It's a photo negative. Everything the two games are not. Perhaps the contradictory nature of the marketing in the game fits. Portal 2 has some of the most vociferous antagonists of any game series, but the quietest protagonist. It's a single-player game with an iconic campaign, but whose freshest innovation is surely its co-op mode. Both it and its prequel are remembered and memed for their surprisingly human musical moments, but they only come after hours of dispassionate and calculated puzzle solving. Portal 2 is widely regarded as one of the finest games ever made, but surely it's also one of the least ambitious. Not to mention it's perhaps the best-selling modern puzzle game, a surefire bet to make more money with sequels and similar games, but made by a developer who has forsaken making such similar games. This review is an attempt to pull apart these strings and find some meaning within the hollowed test chambers of Aperture Science. In the first section, we consider Portal 2's protagonist, Shell, who is perhaps the silentest and loneliest protagonist in gaming. In the second section, we will discuss why Portal 2 was the best game I ever played at the tender age of 20. In the final segment, I'll ask the question we've all been dying to unpack. Is Portal 2 too perfect for its own good? Come along with me, and let's try to unravel this potato-shaped onion. Well, before that, do you know who likes to eat potatoes? Me. You can feed me potatoes in the form of a Patreon subscription, which seriously helps me produce these videos. Not sold yet? For a small fee, less than how much money I spend a month on a potatoes, you can get your name read aloud in the credits of these videos, chat with me on Discord, and feel good about yourself for supporting a freak on the internet trying to make meaningful videos. Now, let's step through a portal to our first discussion. About halfway through Portal 2, Shell and her robot companion Wheatley escape GLaDOS's test chambers and start disabling her turrets and neurotoxin. On their path of neutralization, the two cross an abandoned grade school science fair, part of Aperture Science's Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. The exhibit contains a variety of projects, many involving a potato battery, but one stands apart from the rest as its overgrown potato, suspiciously shaped like GLaDOS herself, has infested the area, burrowing into the ceiling and ground below. If the observant or obsessive Portal fan looks closer, 
they find that this strange science project was made by none other than Shell, the game's protagonist. This detail is easy to miss and inessential for progressing through the game, but it does offer Portal's players the sole moment of characterization for the character they embody across the series' runtime. That's right, despite starring in two story-based AAA games and having a name that most PC gamers recognize, Shell is a complete foreigner to us. She has no personality or voice lines, she takes no action apart from the player's direction, even her physical appearance is obscured behind the veil of a first-person camera. Shell is, outside a potato experiment gone awry, a nothing character defined by two relatively superficial traits. She is a woman and she is a test subject. Anything else you could say about her would be your own projections, not anything communicated or even implied within the text of either game. For those who have played video games before, this characterization isn't too much of a shock. Shell is just another silent protagonist like Link, Gordon Freeman, Doomguy, Kirby, Mario, Chrono, Samus, Wily e. Coyote, Ness, Jack, and Steve from Minecraft. For these characters, we can argue the lack of an identifiable personality is unremarkable and kind of the point. The conventional wisdom is players better identify with a character who doesn't have a voice, as a voice or personality may create dissonance between the character and player and decrease the latter's ability to connect with the game. So many titles employ the silent protagonist narrative conceit, it does not just border on cliché, it sails right up and over into banal and overused trope. Yet the reason for its existence isn't always easy to pin down. Is it because game designers are lazy and don't want to write a character? Is it because it leads to more interesting narratives within games? Is it because it helps design a game better? Or perhaps it's just an artistic direction to keep the player focused on the gameplay? Well, it's kind of all and none of the above. And Shell, the scientist protagonist, helps us better understand what to do with these guys. Before we get to Shell though, let's catch our bearings and look at some of the most popular silent protagonists to better understand what's up with all these mute bozos. After all, if we look at the history of fiction, silent protagonists are few and far between. The classic literature heroes like Don Quixote, Odysseus, Elizabeth Bennet, Romeo, and Hamlet are all big talkers, and the same holds true for film. Games, though, are a different story. I've come up with a graph on which to judge each of these tongue-tied wonders. On the x-axis, we consider just how speechless are these dorks. On the far left, we've got heroes who do not speak at all, and on the far right, we've got the ones who just won't shut up. On the y-axis, we consider how much a part of the game's world the protagonist is. Do they have family or friends, a profession, a personal history? Do they convey personality in ways other than talking? While well, that doesn't necessarily correlate to how silent a protagonist is, the more a part of the game world, the more defined the character is, which in essence allows them to be spoken for by how the world around them reacts to their presence. In essence, the purpose of this graph is to ask just how much character does this character have, or how distinct are they from the actions of the player. I'm automatically going to disqualify any unnamed or player-generated characters from this list, because they're not meant to be distinct characters in the first place. So of course, they won't have much personal baggage or talk too much. It's pretty fun to put video game characters on this graph. Cloud from Final Fantasy VII would be near the top of the y-axis. He's got a ton of friends, a rich and convoluted backstory, and is part of his world's destiny. But he's near the middle of the x-axis because he's a strong, silent type, even if he does actually talk across the game. 
Duke Nukem, meanwhile, won't shut up, but doesn't have any meaningful friends or relationships, so I'd put him way to the right, but more on the middle of the vertical axis, maybe even a little lower. Solid Snake talks all the time over comms, and he's a major figure in the history of the 20th century, so easy top right character. His top right's over there for you. I'm hoping this system of organization is starting to feel intuitive. For our purposes, this graph could easily include many different characters, every video game character. But we're going to limit our discussion to the part of the graph which would have silent protagonists, which is the far left. To the surprise of no one, many silent protagonists do indeed talk. You may think that disqualifies them from inclusion in the category, but I disagree, so you're just going to have to live with it. Take, for example, iconic JRPG protagonist, Chrono of Chrono Trigger. While Chrono does have two lines in the game script, localized only to four words and one specific ending, the game implies Chrono speaks quite a bit, perhaps most obviously in the game's opening segment, when Marl asks him his name and a moment later exclaims, wow, what a nice name, pleased to meet you. Chrono is a silent protagonist, a man of few words to be sure, but he clearly has the ability to speak and exercises it. We're just not privy to what he says. Meanwhile, in our connection axis, Chrono starts the game with pre-existing relationships. A mom, a best friend in Luca, other characters who recognize him from around the game world. As the plot progresses, Chrono is enmeshed in relationship with the world around him. His friends love him, consider him strong, loyal, and pure of heart. So on our silent protagonist chart, he gets placed near the top right as a character who speaks once in a while and has a lot of friends. Though he doesn't quite hit the top of the characterization axis because he's still just a bog standard hero with generic personality traits. Another bog standard hero with generic personality traits is Link. While we generally envision Link as a strong, silent type, like Chrono, he also speaks. Not just terribly in Wand of Gamelon or screaming with a swing of his sword, but generally too. Throughout the duration of Zelda 2, Link talks to himself. He does the same thing in the scene in Link's Awakening. Link also has dialogue options in Skyward Sword. Link usually starts his games with friends and family, not to mention a heroic destiny. You know, he's one of the three most important people in the world. In Ocarina of Time, while he's an orphan, he's also a well-known member of the Kokiri village and has a best friend in Surya. In Wind Waker, before the game even begins, he's got a sister and a grandma and is feeling out some island life. Link isn't always so ingratiated, he's practically a nobody in the original game, and his personality can just be boiled down to like courageous, but it stands to reason that he's in the same ballpark as Chrono, further to the right top of the graph of silent protagonists. Nintendo seemed to adore the silent hero, and their other leading man, Mario, fits the bill. Mario is a unique case, because pretty much anyone who has played a Mario game has heard the guy's voice, as Charles Martinet's incessant are burned in the memory of all of us. Even in Mario's 3D debut, he closes out the credits by literally telling us, Thank you so much for playing my game. So, yeah, the guy talks, even if it is seldomly. Mario also has friends and family, a brother in Luigi, a relationship with Princess Peach, the Toads who all seem to look up to him. Even in the first game, the Toads refer to him by name when he completes the wrong castle. Still, these relationships are vague, and Mario has even less personality than Link or Chrono, and how he got to the Mushroom Kingdom or what he's doing there are a perpetual mystery. Unless we, I guess, watch a feature film which tells us how it all went down. But anyways, he's a bit more like Link on the speaking axis, with a bit less characterization. Okay, so at this point you might be starting to wonder, hey, these guys aren't really silent protagonists. After all, they aren't silent. Well, I'll throw you a bone with Valve's leading man, Gordon Freeman. Unlike most of our other mute boys, Mr. Freeman does not say a single word in the Half-Life series, at least to my knowledge. He can, in theory, speak, but as far as dialogue within the game goes, 
it's nil. Gordon does have some character though. He's got a bunch of scientist friends back at the lab. He's got a PhD in theoretical physics from MIT. He works a relatively specific job in a research facility and everyone in the world knows who he is. Heck, he's from Seattle. So in terms of characterization, while Gordon isn't exactly lighting up the radio waves with his golden voice, he is someone specific, you know, a real character. Many other protagonists follow suit. I don't know what to do with like Steve from Minecraft. Kids these days seem to like the guy, but I think he's more of a default option of like the chosen undead or your fallout survivor. He's not really a fleshed out character who we're meant to identify with, who's part of his world. If we do put him on the chart though, we'd have to plop him down as far to the bottom and to the left as possible, which is impressive, I suppose. But I don't, I don't even know why that guy's a name. Why does Steve from Minecraft have a name? He'd just be the guy from Minecraft, if you ask me. Because it could be anyone, he could be you, he could be me. Or someone else, a squirrel. Kirby talks a little bit and has some friends, even if less than Martin Link. Samus, the only girl other than Shell I could meaningfully note, talks so much that reviewing her gameography, it's difficult to say she's silent at all. But even if we concede that, she still has a specific profession and has a fleshed out backstory which explains her motivation. Doom Guy is pretty silent as he was meant to be a player stand in from the start, but even he has a job as a Marine, a pretty specific profession which tells us a lot about him. And his brutish actions can then reaffirm. And I've got nowhere else to put this tidbit, but all of these characters' friends comment on their silence. The most passe of these phrases is, man of few words, eh? Which is like the most lazy self-referential writing and only serves to undermine the plot of the games in the first place. But I digress. Pretty much all silent protagonists have one thing in common. They're men. If we go deeper than the most popular franchise, this truth continues to hold. Bomber, man. Ryu from Breath of Fire, Claude from GTA 3, Corvo from Dishonored, The Kid from Bastion, Meet Boy, I'm sure you can think of more. The epidemic of masculine silent types is not some vast conspiracy. It makes sense if we consider the purpose of the silent protagonist as a vehicle for the most immediate possible identification with the character the player is meant to embody. Historically, game makers assume their audiences are entirely or nearly entirely male. So of course, when they're jamming mute characters to play as, the one identifiable trait they're likely to gravitate toward is masculinity. Femininity seems to inherently invite characterization, perhaps to serve as justification for why the player is stuck as this girl. In Resident Evil, we play as Jill Valentine to heighten the horror of the game's mansion, right? Or in Tomb Raider, we're meant to ogle the protagonist. Thus, they have to speak, they have to be characters within this world. In either case, in the same way lion refers to all lions and lioness, only girl lions, or man can refer to mankind, but women refers to us girls, silent video game protagonists are almost always coded as male because that's the default setting and silent protagonists are the default player character of games. Which is why Shell feels a bit special, despite how unremarkable she is. Shell, placed on this chart, blows everybody else out of the water in terms of silence and lack of characterization. Remember, she is not a make your own character. She's a specific part of our game world. She's just insignificant and stubbornly wordless. I don't think Valve put too much forethought into Shell's feminine characterization. In interviews about the character, the game's creators mostly discuss why they made her mute to keep her as a straight man in the chaotic world dominated by GLaDOS, Wheatley, and Cave Johnson. It's my personal belief that Shell is a woman because it would more meaningfully differentiate her from Gordon Freeman, Val, you know, Valve's leading man. Because remember, Portal 1 came out when Half-Life 2 was still dropping expansions. Also, Portal's mostly non-violent gameplay probably fit better for a woman to feel like a natural fit for the role, even if we're not going to ask how Gordon Freeman theoretical physics PhD is somehow the most adept gunfighter in the galaxy. 
To be clear, I can't prove any of that, but my hunch is Shell's femininity is primarily a not Gordon Freeman marker. If Valve did choose their main character's gender for superficial reasons, they continued the trend with any reference to gender within the game. GLaDOS uses societal expectations for women as a means to motivate or degrade a shell. Particularly, GLaDOS mocks Shell's weight. She may be a blimp flying through the air, packing on the pounds, or very healthy, implying she isn't feminine enough. These observations affirm Shell's feminine gender, but do little to tell us about her as a character. After all, GLaDOS is just trying to get under her or our skin, so no facts about us are conveyed through these insults, only a better understanding of GLaDOS's ideas of motivation and cruelty. Shell, regardless of appearance, presents no personality for us to examine, no character for us to identify with. But that doesn't stop us from trying, does it? Shell seems to naturally invite fan theories and interpretations of her character. The wiki for her character argues that Shell is highly resourceful, quick thinking, very intelligent, strong willed, good at creative problem solving, and does not panic easily. Um, uh, no, fam. It's you, the player, that matches those adjectives. Gordon Freeman isn't an idiot when you can't solve one of his puzzles. Mario isn't smart because you can speedrun Super Mario 64, and Shell isn't intelligent because the player can solve some puzzles while wearing her skin. It's not just the Wikipedia page either. Many corners of the internet, both around Portal and Portal 2's releases and in the decades since, have devoted some portion of their energy to deciphering who Shell is. As though it's not enough for Shell and Portal to exist, we've got to wiggle our way in to understand everything about them. So we scour the Portal games and their accompanying texts for further understanding. We hypothesize that Shell is Cave and Caroline's daughter, and since GLaDOS is kind of like an artificial Caroline, that Shell might be GLaDOS's daughter. We argue Shell must have a traumatic brain injury since she jumps when asked to speak. We spend an inordinate amount of time seeking to understand who Shell is from an accompanying comic which doesn't even feature her as a character. We hypothesize Shell is a killer potato-powered robot sent from the future Terminator style to teach GLaDOS how to stop the Combine from taking over the Earth in the Half-Life universe. Well, okay, that one's just me. I made that one up. None of it matters. We can try to read into the games as much as we want, but none of it will tell us who Shell is because she's always been right in front of us. In essence, these literal fan readings of the character, attempts to mine the lore of the Portal universe, miss the forest for the trees. We spend so much time trying to construct more characterization for a character deliberately given none and provide dialogue for a character who does not speak. While Shell is not no one, Shell is not someone we're meant to know. She's someone we're meant to embody, a mood and vibe we're supposed to buy into. That mood or vibe, rather than some distinct personality or character trait, is why I love her. Because first and foremost, Shell is the portal gun. Rather than communicate with the world around her with her voice or any social language, Shell communicates by placing portals and stepping through them. She marches toward what feels like an inevitable conclusion, the last test chamber, one which never materializes. Ostensibly, every puzzle solved, every portal created, every elevator ride up to another level is a step closer to freedom. What makes Shell interesting is that while her entire means of communication with the world around her is the portal gun, the gun itself is useful in only insofar as it can take her away from the broken scientific wonderland of Aperture Science. If she were to ever leave the lab, she would also leave behind her only way to interact with the world. Shell as a character cannot exist beyond Aperture, because we cannot imagine who she is without a portal gun or puzzles to solve, because at the end of the day, Shell's identity, from our perspective, is entirely wrapped up with being a test subject 
while trying to escape test subjectum. She has no home to return to. She has no special skills or relationships we can imagine her having in some other place. She has no personal history to nostalgically return to. She is, again, no one. And as a result, Shell is a profoundly lonely character, a consequence of being the silentist protagonist. Shell only has two relationships. GLaDOS, a one-sided relationship in which a sadist tortures her, and Wheatley, a one-sided relationship where an idiot uses her. She has no characterization. She doesn't even communicate non-verbally without the player's input. Consider, the further down and to the left of our graph we go, the more lonely a character becomes. A character at the top right is well characterized, has many relationships, and maintains those relationships through speech. Meanwhile, the fewer conversations one has, the fewer relationships one cultivates, the more lonely you are. The less of a character you are, the less human you are. Shell is not just the silentest protagonist, she's the loneliest. She teaches us what loneliness does to a person. It dehumanizes them. Shell is barely recognizable as a human. She could be a robot, she could be a kangaroo, she could be a ghost or a sentient rock. Ironically, these less human forms would probably give her more personality to project, but as she stands, Shell is barely human, barely anything at all. She is the specter of loneliness, personified with all the lack of character that comes with it. I can empathize with Shell. I know what it's like to feel profound loneliness and to be defined by it. Loneliness is dehumanizing. When I was a child, I spent most of my time alone, and I too had portal guns, a Game Boy, a Nintendo 64, a PlayStation 2, books, music, pencil, and paper on which to write stories. Each of these, like Shell's portal gun, defined me more than any personality trait or relationships because they were the absence of personality or relationships. They were activities with which to fill the whole of nothing loneliness provides. But mostly, they just hollowed me out, and like Shell, made me more of what I wasn't. The things I did to escape myself. You can only run away from yourself for so long. It's fitting Shell ends both games with Ichi's only boss fight, a moment of genuine relationship with another being. They may be rooted in violence, but what is violence if not on some level a kind of connection to another? It is only once Shell connects in such a way that she's allowed to leave Aperture, to imagine herself as something more than a lab rat, because as long as she's defined by the portal gun, a device ironically characterized by movement and change, She'll always be trying to escape. Not GLaDOS, whose endless test chambers give her endless options to avoid the real problem, but herself. And doesn't that make a perfect match for loneliness? Loneliness is not the same as being alone. To be alone is, you know, to feel alone is to know you wish to be around other people. It's a sense of emptiness, which can then be filled the moment someone comes around. To be lonely, paradoxically, is to be full, full of yourself, trapped inside one's mind, trapped inside one's thoughts and actions. The lonely person, in my personal experience, does not wish to be around others, for that does nothing to resolve the tension. The lonely person wishes to not be around themselves. How we escape is individual, into drugs, into hobbies, maybe into others. But as I've learned the hardest ways, being around others does not innately cure loneliness. And in fact, it can often make loneliness more poignant. The loneliest I've ever felt is when I've been around other people. For Shell, such loneliness is powerfully felt. If Shell is the portal gun, it's worth noting the gun is not simply a transportation device. It's a possibility machine. When one shoots a portal before they ever step through it, they're able to see what's on the other side, and as a result, each portal is as much a window as a door. From that window, what can we see? 
usually just more tests, more activities. But if we angle the portals just right, the device allows us to see the one person who eluded us all along, Shell herself. By acting as a mirror, the portal gun can only tell us the truth. We are alone. So alone, we can't even look ourselves in the eyes. When I'm alone, I too have a tendency to retreat into mirrors. I find comfort in them, the potential to see myself, reaffirm my humanity, know that at least someone, myself, is experiencing me. But when I'm lonely, the sight of myself gives me no relief. It only offers more pain because as I look at me, I stop seeing a person in front of me, just a reflection personified not by her actions or personality, but the profound absence of anything else around her by the fullness she feels of herself. When I look at Shell through a portal, I find the same emotion. Thus, the most beautiful aspect of Portal and Portal 2 isn't their superb level design, wonderful voice acting, or delightful central puzzle solving device, but the two times Shell leaves Aperture Science. Both moments are accompanied by music, songs about her, they define her from the perspective of someone else, and in the process allow us to see Shell not as an us who does, but as a someone else who did. That inversion, that turn toward the other's past tense is everything. Today, while I still struggle with chronic loneliness, I can promise you it gets better. It gets way better because every day I take steps to be with others, and in turn, I become part of their past tense, their history, and they become part of mine. And in the beautiful dovetail of perspective, I no longer feel alone. I feel like half a puzzle falling into place with another. We might say, rather than the subject, stepping through them on the way to somewhere else, I feel like one portal connecting to another where being one half of something is infinitely more meaningful than being one whole of nothing. Portal 2 is the best game I ever played when I was 20 years old. It released on April 18th, 2011, six months and five days before I left teenage dumb behind and welcomed my 20s. Oh, I was once so young, I've already said goodbye to that decade of my life too. It was a pretty good time, but we're not here to talk about who I was between 20 and 29. We're here to talk about Portal 2 and why it was the best game I'd ever played at the time of its release. Though, I kind of loved Portal 2 before it even came out or before I ever played it because I was hyped. At the time, I loved Valve. The orange box, my introduction to their games, was and still is the most incredible bundle gaming has to offer. My favorite game from the collection was Portal, and the potential for more puzzles shooting fun was probably the most excited I've ever been for a new release. Though, if you had talked to me about Portal in early 2010, a year before Portal 2 graced our computer screens, I would have responded with a question. What's Portal? As I noted in my review of Shadow of the Colossus, I dropped games as a hobby from about 2006 to 2010, or more specifically, the years I was in high school. Part of the reason was my family's bout of being unhoused, where all my gaming devices were shuttered into storage. Another part was just growing up. At the time, I was involved in extracurriculars. I played in the marching band, two jazz bands, and the wind ensemble. I argued with other people on the merits of French nuclear supremacy in debate. I sung poorly in choir. I participated in a local church's youth group and Bible study. And to everyone's surprise, including me, I even made some friends. Not to mention, I was a high school student with homework and a love for reading books and watching old movies. Moreover, the people I hung out with in high school didn't play video games, as opposed to the kinds of friends I had in the years leading up to it, who only played games when we hung out together. As a result, I didn't spend time by myself playing games for entertainment nor did I use them as a way to connect to others. 
I wasn't abstinent from the hobby. I played casual titles like Guitar Hero and Wii Sports. I competed with a friend in Minesweeper now and again, and I would play random games that came my way. But whereas from ages 5 to 15, games were a refuge, an addiction, what I spent nearly all my free time doing. Throughout high school, they were demoted. While I viewed games as art, a perspective Shadow of the Colossus gave me, they felt like a less valuable way to spend my time, a kind of waste. I think part of it also had to do with shaking the gamer label I'd held since I could read a Game Boy screen well enough to play Pokemon. I didn't like that label in 2006. It made me feel small and insignificant in the eyes of others. When the myself I knew was so much more vibrant. A writer, a musician, devoted friend, cinemaphile, you know, whatever. Still, like many high school students, as my time structuring my behavior around the ringing of bells dwindled, so too did my desire to be there. I was struck with a potent case of senioritis. My situation didn't make it any easier. As graduation approached, I was on my own incredibly often. My later years of high school, my parents' business of selling swords, dresses, and kilts at renaissance fairs took off, and they spent weeks at a time away from home. None of my siblings lived with us consistently either. And senior year, I had a kind of falling out with my main friend group, which was entirely my own fault. Skipping past the details, which would be too painful for me to recount due to how much regret I have over this, I had conflict with the group, and I ghosted them rather than attempt to resolve it. The action was wrong, unhealthy, and it's still painful for me to dwell on 13 years later. I consider it the worst thing I've ever done, but that's for some other video, some other time. At that time, I started skipping class. I had no one at home to keep me accountable. The school didn't seem to care. I was already accepted into college and I had no friends I wanted to see at school anyway, so why bother? The month of February 2010, I attended one day of school per week. To emphasize just how much class I missed, near the end of my senior year, I had a discussion with an assistant principal who told me that per their rule book, I had missed enough class to warrant automatic failure and not be allowed to graduate. But because I was a good kid and had good grades in all my classes, they weren't going to enforce that rule this time. Adulthood approached and I fell into an empty hole with no easy way out. So as the childhood came to an end, I returned to loneliness. I was a pathetic creature. My mom gave me a bunch of money for feeding myself during those long stretches without supervision, and I, the savvy teenager I was, would drive to McDonald's every single night and purchase a McDouble and large fry, which totaled then $3.05. If I was thirsty, I would go to the Walmart next to the McDonald's and pick up a two liter of Dr. Thunder, which was 95 cents. I would then stay up until 3 or 4 a.m. reading books and watching flicks on Turner Classic Movies, my cable's on-demand service, or my Wii's Netflix channel. It's ironic that while my GameCube is still my most played home console of all time, I exclusively used my Wii to watch movies. I'd wake up around noon each day to an empty house and repeat the process all over again. A movie I connected with from that era is the 1964 Vincent Price vehicle, The Last Man on Earth, based on the book I Am Legend. In that film, a character repeats the same routine over and over again, his only moral relief coming once that routine is broken, even if it's broken by his own demise. Perhaps I too was waiting for my own end, hard to say. In the immediate years following this reclusive lifestyle, I spoke on it with a sense of pride, a feeling that I created all these personal rituals in my den of loneliness, a sense that I survived a difficult time by being a weird little freak. 
but it didn't have to be so difficult. My junior year, I had a similar potential for loneliness. My parents were out of town just as often, but because I was part of a close-knit friend group, I didn't spend that much time alone. Friends came over when my parents were out of town, and I went out with them to hang out. Our activities were limited to what you can do in a small town, but we made our own fun. We rented movies from Family Video, listened to music, played board games, the kind of stuff teenagers who don't party or drink do. Instead of this social engagement, and like many silent protagonists, my senior year, I forced my way into a self-exile I convinced myself was outside of my control. In that loneliness, and with the help of my dad getting me a laptop for college, I started to get back into video games. One big draw was the orange box. I actually avoided its marquee title Half-Life 2 because the Ravenholm section scared me too much, but two games hooked me. One my imagination, and the other time. Team Fortress 2 was the one that took my time, as I poured dozens of hours into pushing payloads and capturing flags. But the game that stuck with me long after I played it was Portal, a funny, perfect puzzle game. Viewers of my multi-month streaming journey to determine the best 100 games of all time will know that I am a total Portal groupie, and in particular, I continually used the phrase, Portal is pound for pound just the best game, without meaningfully explaining myself. So I guess it's time to do so, because Portal kind of is perfect, and this is why, as we'll discuss later in the video, Portal 2 may be too perfect. While the phrase is stupid and I don't actually like it, I do kind of feel like, at least by one set of game design principles, Portal really is pound for pound the best game. That phrase is actually two different ideas combined into one. Pound for pound is the evocative part of the phrase, but it's actually pretty simple. We're going to consider the game not in terms of total content or potential enjoyment, but the efficiency of that enjoyment. Portal is short, fun, a well-designed game. It has little to no downtime, is paced particularly well, and is memorable. I doubt even people who don't like it don't remember it. Over Thanksgiving this year, I shared it with my 10-year-old pseudo-niece, who has little experience with video games, and she loved it. So, while Portal doesn't necessarily offer the highest cumulative enjoyment compared to, I don't know, an endlessly replayable game like StarCraft II, Counter-Strike, or World of Warcraft, those other games can't compete with how dense, accessible, and enjoyable Portal is. Sort of like how it's not fair to compare a lightweight boxer with a heavyweight. The latter may be stronger and could easily win a fight, but that's because they're competing in different ways, in different arenas, under different sets of rules. The second half of the claim, Portal is pound for pound just the best game, is the best game part. And I'm not a huge fan of objectively critiquing games, which to me, the entire idea that a game could be the best one is inherently a bit insulting. Still, I assume that if we're going to use that word to describe a game, we mean the one that's the best designed, and again, while there is no objective criteria for determining good design, for a long time now, i viewed well-designed games in an exceptionally Valvian way. They're the ones which best teach you how to play them. The difference between it and good but not great imitators like Viewfinder, Tal's Principle, Super Liminal, or The Witness is their inability to replicate Val's attention to detail. As is often the case, it's the detriments of similar competition that make the best shine. Portal is a fantastic example of this, because while we may feel the concept of the game is intuitive and easy to understand, in actuality, the only reason it feels so good is because Valve designed it so well, you never realized they were tricking you into learning how to play. Or you did and it probably felt pandering, because it is a game made for people who have never played games before. When I played Portal for the first time, I guess I was dumb enough to fall for the trick. I played it start to finish in one burst and fell in love. It felt so simple, yet complex. It needed some manual dexterity, but success was not determined by how fast or well you could aim, and it had a fun story with memorable characters. Or one memorable character, really. Do you disagree? Do you disagree, little cat? 
Viewers may recall that I noted that Super Mario 64 was a great game for a child, me, because it was all about movement, a skill children naturally learn from a young age. Well, Portal activated on the same movement-related joys I got from Super Mario 64 while teasing my soon-to-be adult mind with new challenges. It was like riding a bike again, and helped kickstart my return to the gaming hobby. Other games certainly helped. The summer before I went off to college, StarCraft 2 came out, and some of my new friends at the time were huge StarCraft 1 nerds, so they got it and we played together. They cruelly forced me and someone else to play each other with no knowledge of the game. I built just loads of overlords because I was tired of getting supply boxed, but as a result I had no army and was swiftly stomped. Despite my loss, I was hooked. I picked up StarCraft 2 on release and it became my go-to game, and to spurn those friends who wouldn't teach me, I worked hard to be way better than them. And I was. But without Portal, I probably wouldn't have bothered with becoming a PC gamer in the first place. Going to college also meant meeting new people, and my floor was filled with potential friends who all had one thing in common. They loved to game. The characters on my floor played Super Smash Bros., and my Wii, long abused as a simple Netflix machine, finally got its time to shine. My dorm room was a den of conflict, a perpetually open door and people always coming in to play violent rounds of Nintendo characters beating each other up. I would literally do homework to the background noise of chaos as three to four people who didn't even live in my room duked it out. My roommate, John, who's still my best friend, check out his YouTube channel Collector John by the way, was a huge proponent in getting me back into games, as his tastes geared less toward social beat-em-ups like Smash and StarCraft, and more towards single-player journeys. He loved action RPGs and shooters, and with his high-powered laptop, gave me my first experiences of games like Crisis, Deus Ex, and Metro. John's taste is wildly different than my own, but that's what's beautiful about having him as a friend. He pushes me into areas I'd never consider, never even see without him. And through him, I learn more about games, more about what I like and don't like. It was through John I first experienced Portal 2, though I abetted the cause. Despite my personal love for Portal, John was the bigger Valve stan. He grew up playing their games with his brother. Unfortunately, he was bombed when Portal 2 was announced because he knew he couldn't afford it. I got more financial aid than him, so as a surprise, I put some of the government's money toward making my friend happy and purchased him a copy rather than myself. I handed in playing Portal 2 myself to watch John play instead. I wonder how that felt for him. He was the younger sibling who probably spent much of his youth watching his older brother play such games. Now he was the older brother, letting his pal watch as he conquered a Valve Games challenges. We played through Portal 2 in two days on John's quote big ass Toshiba Cosimo 18.4 inch laptop and fell in love. The puzzles were engaging, the plot moved along nicely, Cave Johnson is a national treasure, and all the common praise people gave the game then and give it now. Both him and I recently recalled our favorite moment from those 2011 days, shooting the moon. For those who haven't played it, all three of you, the Portal Guns lore as established somewhere between the background and foreground of the game's story is that the device only works with paint made from moon rocks. The game's last action, right when all hope seems lost, is where you shoot the now exposed moon, creating a portal not meters apart but 200,000 miles. When John shot the moon within a week of the game's release on April 19th, 2011, we lost our minds. We shouted, we laughed, we probably screamed. What a fitting way to end the game and what a wonderful memory I'll always have with my friend. I hope you can sense an irony between where we started this section and this moment of jubilation. For the first 20 or so years of my life, Games were this thing I did by myself, an escape from other people. 
an escape from myself. Even when I played games with others, that was the case. Portal, one of the games that got me back into games, was something I experienced completely alone. Before Portal 2 and my friendship with John, I can't even recall if I ever discussed the game with another human being. That's how solitary my first playthrough was, and my relationship with games was exactly the same. Yet here, on a giant laptop in a dorm room in 2011, I facilitated someone else's play and watched, having a complete blast as a backseat driver. Isn't Portal 2 kind of like the perfect game to backseat as well with its wonderful monologues, spectacular art direction, and puzzles which make talking through a solution with a friend feel like a collaborative effort? Portal 2 was great because we experienced it as two people, and it taught me how much more enjoyable games are when you play them with someone else, when you talk about them with someone else. That's why it's the best game I ever played when I was 20. Even if I waited until I was 25 and a Steam sale knocked the price down to like three bucks to finally purchase a copy and play it for myself. From Portal 2 onward, even if I wasn't watching a friend play a game or having them accompany me on an adventure, I stopped playing games alone in a lonely state. Today, I mostly play games with my wife, but elsewise I play them with my friends or so I can start up a conversation with my friends or with you guys. When I got to my PhD program, I started weekly streams to play competitive games with other graduate students. Even my scholarship and these YouTube videos, which are mostly about games, are a way to escape the loneliness games once symbolized for me. Now I play them so I can have a chance to tell you what they mean to me. As far as I'm concerned, Portal 2 may not have been the cause, but it marks a profound shift in my relationship to games. And that's why it's the best game I ever played when I was 20. Precisely because I didn't play it the way I had every other game before. Unfortunately, I do come to you 12 years later to admit a new truth. Portal 2 is too perfect, and the person it inspired me to grow into finds it pale in comparison to memory's shadow. The chorus effect is one of my favorite ways to modulate a tone from a guitar, synthesizer, piano, or voice. Essentially, when you add a chorus effect to something, you copy the original sound, play it alongside the original, and slightly detune the copied signal to give the impression of more depth. Many guitarists create the chorus sound with an effects pedal, but others may simply record the same part twice to create it. You might be paying it between ears or something too. Regardless of how the sound is achieved, its presence in modern music is nearly ubiquitous. Everyone uses it. Despite its popularity, the chorus effect is a strange creature. In essence, you imperfectize a sound, pull it slightly out of tune and in the process, create something deeper and more interesting to listen to. Strangely, the chorus effect has an evil twin, where a sound phases in with itself. Essentially, if you copy an effect too perfectly and play it alongside the original rather than the two growing, they shrink and sound thinner in the mix. Portal 2 is too perfect in the same way a chorus effect without any detuning is too perfect. It matches its original so closely that the sound appears thin rather than full. Now, when I say original, you may think I mean Portal 1, and I do to some degree. We'll get to it. But more meaningfully, I mean the idea of Portal 2 as an expansion to the original Portal game is too perfectly achieved. It's so singular of an experience, an expression of good game design, that it lacks any of the messiness that allows great art to remain relevant over time. Portal 2, instead, is like a perfectly drawn circle. We can marvel at its perfection, consider all the effort it must have taken to render a circle without mistakes, but also struggle to see why, over time, 
we should continue to invest ourselves in that perfection. When its marble statuesque nature implodes our ability to make more of what's there. Though, before we begin, a few notes on what I mean when I say a game is perfect. It seems most people, when they describe a film, game, TV show, or album as perfect, they mean really, really, really good. I do not mean that. I mean the goals of the game and the game itself are synchronized. Or rather, those games which accomplish all they set out to do. Pong is my personal er example of a perfect game. Pong is meant to be an accessible, fun, and easy to understand introduction to the concept of playing digital games on a screen. And who can say it does not succeed in accomplishing those goals? Does that mean Pong is the best game? Better than Super Monkey Ball? No, because perfect does not mean best. Pretend for a moment you've got two basketball players competing against each other. One shoots the ball five times, makes all five shots. Good job. I suppose in some respects that's a perfect game. But their opponent who lobs the ball 30 times and swishes on 20 attempts had a better game. They scored more points and contributed more to their team's victory. Even if they only made two thirds of their shots. Perhaps we should aim for perfection, but it should be clear perfection is not quality. Most games I consider perfect are from the early era of gaming. Frogger, Pac-Man, Tetris are a few games I would say reach the mantle of perfection, but they aren't my favorite games. They achieve perfection not in spite of their limited goals, but because of them. A perfectly drawn circle has only one goal perfectly replicate a shape. But that goal doesn't make the circle interesting. As the gaming medium continued to grow out of that arcade era, most game designers expanded their goals. They became aspirational. They bite off more than they can chew, and that's a good thing. Most games are just too interesting to be perfect. They desire to be too much. So for my tastes, today's games often struggle to achieve perfection, and that's okay. Even Portal 2 isn't actually perfect itself, it just gets closer than anybody else. So this said, when I argue Portal 2 is too perfect, I do not mean it would be better if it had some flaws. I mean that its perfection gets in the way of it being a better or more interesting game, of it inspiring me to make games, of my relationship to the game evolving over time. You see, this entire season of elaborate reviews, we've been taking a kind of life's journey. I've considered the best game I ever played when I was 5, 10, 15, and now 20. For each of these other entries in the series, we compared favorably how I felt about the game then with how I feel about the game now. Super Mario 64 was a freestyling paradise of exploration and possibility when I was 5 or 6 years old, but returning to it at 30 I found the 3D platformer genre hadn't meaningfully leapt from those roots, and that Mario 64 only seems to grow stranger and more oblong as fans speedrun it and make beta recreations like Build 3313. These recreations, like a chorus effect, expand and grow the very idea of Super Mario 64 until it becomes unrecognizable. In 1999, Ocarina of Time was a meaningful adventure, a symbol of my childhood in the countryside and the woman who raised me. In 2023, I finally beat the game after a lifetime of avoiding its conclusion and found new meaning in the actions we take in video games. With Eco and Shadow of the Colossus, I considered the meaning of a lonely single player game for a lonely teenage girl. After, I considered what it meant to me as someone who had recently survived a near death experience. In each case, the past and present collided in a way I found meaningful, poignant, and fruitful. It was the course effect in action. Same game different girl. I played through Portals 1 and 2 months ago, and I've remained transfixed on finding some new meaning in them. But I can honestly say, despite trying to force that genuine feeling again and again, 
That Portal 2 wall meant so much to me 10 years ago. As I already explained, it means little to me today. So instead of trying to find new meaning in the game's various test chambers, I want to discover meaning in the photo negative. Perhaps if we can uncover what's missing from Portal 2, why it doesn't resonate with me anymore, we can learn something just as potent if I have something more straightforwardly valuable to say. Portal 2 features a particularly unique synchronicity between its goals as a game and what the game actually is. We can determine what these goals are within the text. My distilled version of the list would probably be something like satisfying and accessible puzzles with simple mechanics which make the user feel smart. Two, a humorous story with sufficient intrigue and creativity as to be memorable, but not taking away agency from the player at any point. Three, well paced, narratively and ludically, so the player doesn't feel lost while playing. And four, on the whole, great attention to detail to make every important aspect of the game pop out as much as possible. We can say that essentially if Portal 2 reached these heights, if it accomplished these goals, it would be a success. And as Valve games often do, they accomplished these goals with flying colors. Now, it's worth noting that these are pretty much the same four goals as Portal 1. So what exactly is the relationship between the two portals? Well, I don't even consider Portal 2 to be a genuine sequel to Portal 1. Instead, Portal is a short film, and we can consider Portal 2 to be the full-length movie version of that short film, like Whiplash to Whiplash, Within the Woods to The Evil Dead, Bottle Rocket to Bottle Rocket, Palooka to Napoleon Dynamite, and What We Do in the Shadows to What We Do in the Shadows to What We Do in the Shadows. In each of those cases, and many more, the feature length version accomplishes pretty much the same goals as the short film, it just does so in a more robust and fleshed out manner. And Portal 2 is simply a more robust and fleshed out Portal 1, right? Portal 1 is a 2 to 3 hour game, Portal 2 is an 8 to 10 hour game. Portal 1 has, by my head count, around 6 specific mechanics, portals, boxes, slash switches, turrets, moving platforms, energy balls, and small switches. Portal 2 has about a dozen uh, portals, lasers, uh, switches, boxes, jump pad, gravity beam, turrets, bounce gel, slide gel, portal gel, reflective uh, box, light bridge, and switches. Portal 1 has essentially one and a half acts, the first being all the test chambers and the half act when you escape the test chambers and head to fight GLaDOS. Portal 2 has about three acts. Act 1 is like the first game with GLaDOS providing rather standard test chambers to introduce new mechanics. Act 2, which starts after Wheatley takes control, is where Shell and GLaDOS make their way through Cave Johnson's tests deep underground and head back to the surface. Act 3 is composed of Wheatley's final tests and uses both the mechanics from GLaDOS's initial tests and Cave's later tests. The game is wrapped up with a neat bow of a final boss fight. These acts aren't all equal in length, but they essentially mark the journey Shell takes. When described in this way, we can see Portal 2 is just an extended cut of Portal 1. Not all sequels are like this. They may hold similar goals, but often try to add twists or new goals to make their gameplay fresh. Valve, it seems, had similar ideas early in development. They weren't even going to put portals in their game named Portal 2, but inevitably decided to eschew the new and remake the old. Portal 2 is a particularly polished and well-crafted experience, but one which lacks the raw energy of its predecessor and indeed of most games. Such rawness may come from experimentation with new ideas or implementing fresh technology to give a unique experience. Portal 2 has little of that. It's just an expansion of Portal 1. So Portal 2 may be perfect, but it struggles to remain interesting in the process. Let's return to those goals for a moment. Portal 2 is a puzzle game, primarily about thinking. Its puzzles, while not necessarily easy, you always have easy to define goals. Reach that door, get a box to put on this switch, redirect this laser to that doohickey on the wall, this kind of thing. Solutions, meanwhile, mostly exist in the form of knowledge in the user's head, not like real-time tricks they need to perform. For instance, 
Most of the game's puzzles can be completed in under 10 clicks of the mouse, if you know where to click. Many of these puzzles involve novel uses for objects the player already understands, like using a light bridge as a wall to block a turret's line of sight, using bounce gel to knock over turrets, or using lasers to blow up turrets. Okay, not all the new uses are related turrets, but Portal 2's brilliance in terms of design is never giving us the same puzzle twice. We use the same small selection of tools in different combinations and configurations, and the reason we feel smart while solving them is each new puzzle iterates on what came before in a way that's somehow both not so obvious and intuitive. Well, at least they feel intuitive in hindsight. What makes it such a well-designed game isn't that light walls or even portals are such a stellar idea, though they're quite good, but that Valve probably had way more ideas in their back pocket, and they chose to kill those at some point in production. They only kept ideas which could be iterated on in a variety of ways and cut the chaff. Games with too many mechanics can feel daunting, they're not accessible, and games with too narrow of mechanics can feel repetitive. Puzzle games in particular are easy victims of this dichotomy. Even if shooting in Halo is repetitive, if the dexterity required to blow up grunts remains a challenge, the game can retain its entertainment value. If a puzzle game struggles with accessibility, people just quit, because they get bored, they don't know what to do next. And if it's too repetitive, people just quit, because they're bored. It's too repetitive, right? Portal 2 straddles the line perfectly. Its mechanics are multifaceted, but it doesn't contain that many of them. It's a perfect recipe for the kind of accessible puzzle game they were going for, and one many games have tried to emulate since. Still, the narrative and craft of Portal 2 make it stand apart from its imitators. The narrative is well paced, we never spend longer with a main NPC longer than the entirety of Portal 1, instead we just get to spend time with three, GLaDOS, Wheatley, and Cave, who are all funny enough and have their own distinct personalities and challenges associated with them. The three relate to each other in interesting ways. GLaDOS's cold, calculated, and deadly nature plays off Wheatley's impulsive and dumb demeanor, but we find the only real difference between the ends of their temperaments is that Wheatley is a sledgehammer, and GLaDOS is perhaps a scalpel, but both will use their power to hurt others. Cave Johnson cuts to the middle ground, notably more human than the other two, both in his cavalier titan of industry persona and the fact that we experience him age and ultimately die over the course of the narrative. He is impulsive like Wheatley, but in his own way smart like GLaDOS, or at least he has consistent goals and his motivations are easy to understand. Together, this triumvirate of characters bind the story and its memorable twists and turns together. The craft of Portal 2 also can't be denied. It's as AAA as AAA gets. The art direction is great, no puzzles stand out as a thorn in the player's side, the voice acting is tremendous, the gameplay is simple and needs little tutorializing to make sense, etc. 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 You know all this, don't you? If you've watched a video on Portal 2, heck, if you've played Portal 2, you know all this. So why am I giving you this budget retrospective? Well, because it's all a setup for just how lifeless that perfection can feel in retrospect. It's enjoyable the first time around, but I don't have much to gain from a replay other than appreciate the craft further, which I do, but I can't experience Portal 2 differently than I once did. Two playthroughs only yield a higher fidelity version of the same sound signal, which surprisingly makes it smaller in the rearview mirror. I can never be the person who played Portal 2 at 20, 25, 30, and so on. I will always only be the person who played Portal 2 at 20, with a variety of echoes across my life. And that yields a boring experience to try to make a video on. In its perfection, me changing does not change Portal 2. That could be different, perhaps, in other circumstances, if I had hated puzzle games and then later liked them, or maybe if I was like a seven-year-old child when I first played and revisited it as an adult, yeah, maybe, sure. 
But those aren't my case. I played Portal 2 when I was an adult and now I'm still an adult. A different person, but not so drastically different as to reshape what it means to play the game and what I can get out of it. Now, it's worth noting as an adult, I've had a multiplicity of experiences with the same piece of media, but it's always those messy and complex pieces of art that merit continuous return to untangle. Portal 2 is a perfect circle. I've got nothing to untangle, no mess to sort through, no new dimension to consider. In perfection, Portal 2 lacks nuance. What would I say about a perfect circle that hasn't been said before? How could I experience a perfect circle in a way unique to me? Portal 2 has been widely celebrated since its release. It's the third greatest game of all time, according to IGN, and perhaps it's no surprise that Portal 2 has reigned supreme as the highest rated game on Steam since its release. Portal 2 achieved this not by being the genuine best game, but by being just enough of many different things to satisfy the biggest possible crowd. To paraphrase Robert California's dismissal of the Black Eyed Peas, it's a puzzle game for people who don't like puzzle games. It's an action game for people who don't like action games. It's a story game for people who don't like story games. It does everything it does well enough to be liked, to be memorable, to be stellar and significant and cool, but in a way which sacrifices any salient, messy, complicated identity. In a sense, while I can concede Portal 2 is better than its imitators, I usually find more depth than the copycats, because in their imperfection, they offer more meaning, more interesting stuff to talk about. In some ways, Portal 2 is the GLaDOS of games. GLaDOS is perfect at least as far as her computational abilities to accomplish her stated goals are concerned, Portal 2 is perfect in a complementary way. GLaDOS's very existence flattens others. Valve, similarly, pretty much stopped making games like Portal 2 after Portal 2. Even though it was a massive success, where were they left to go? Well, maybe they could make something more messy, more interesting, less perfect, but it seems like, Portal 2 is the culmination of everything they were aiming for since Half-Life 2. A perfect game to end all other games. Now we just get games you can play forever. They are more profitable after all. Yet, something's lost when we play Counter-Strike and Dota for 4,000 hours. Okay, yes, hundreds of dollars on loot crates and skins. But more pertinently, a sense of wholeness. You can fit the whole of Half-Life 2 and Portal in your head. You can't fit the whole of Dota in your head. It's designed to obfuscate such an understanding, and without that understanding, the game exists endlessly into the horizon. But I don't want endless games. I want games with endless meaning and an endless ability to inspire me. I want to be able to take a game and reflect on it anew each time I play it. What I found when I revisited Portal 2 was that, like a perfect circle, it cannot change. The me of 32 and the me of 20 are phased in with each other when we shoot portals to solve satisfying and surprisingly simple puzzles. A perfect circle perfectly contains whatever's in it, and a perfect game is ultimately only perfect and nothing else. I like Portal 2. I love Portal 2. But I feel comfortable, if not fully confident, in saying the truth. Portal 2 will never be more to me than what it is right now. Perhaps there is something beautiful about that level of consistency, that level of perfection. But if there is, it's a cold beauty, one which freezes you when touched. The chorus effect is forced dissonance. As the name suggests, it's meant to evoke the spirit of a choir and the natural tonal and pitch differences between singers. When we experience art a second, third, or hundredth time, we do so in chorus with the past. The movies, music, games, and art which stick with me offer a temporal vibrance. They allow me to re-experience the song again every time I hear it. Both access those old emotions and create new ones. 
It's what makes all the links I go to talking about art for hours and hours worth it. It's why I bother making these videos at all. Truth be told, I'm self-conscious about how personal my reviews are. I know the people who watch my videos, like you, uh, like that about them, but I wonder if you'd rather I just talk about, I don't know, the thing in front of me and not the person who experienced it. Well, when I play Portal 2, I only see the thing in front of me. The me who experienced it then and now is collapsed into a single unified voice. I could get down on my hands and knees, show you just how perfect the circle is, but no explanation of its perfection would explain why it matters, why you should care. So instead I'll tell you a different reason Portal 2 matters. It taught me just how important reflecting on personal experiences. Because when that was stripped away and I forced myself to keep talking about it anyway, the only thing I could write about is the lack of a personal or vulnerable connection to the work. In a sense, this is me at my most vulnerable. I don't have anything more interesting to say about Portal 2, the game. But the idea of Portal 2, that fascinates me. It teaches me to enjoy my own imperfections a little more. After all, they aren't just what make me human, they're what make me art. I suppose that's a beautiful thought to end on. Thank you for watching. <laughs> I'll see you again soon. For now, let's just pet this kitty.